Here's a problem that initially looks like straightforward algebra, but it's hiding something beautiful. The solutions to x cubed minus 3x equals the square root of x plus 2 turn out to have a deep connection to the golden ratio. Let's see why. Before diving into algebra, let's get some visual intuition. A graph will show us where solutions can and can't exist. I'm going to plot both sides as separate functions. The solutions are simply where these curves intersect. The blue curve shows x cubed minus 3x. The green curve is the square root of x plus 2. But notice something important about its domain. The square root is only defined when x plus 2 is non-negative, which means x must be at least negative 2. This immediately rules out a huge portion of the number line. Your first instinct might be to square both sides to eliminate the square root. But this seemingly innocent step creates a serious problem. When you square both sides, you're not just solving your original equation. You're also solving the case where the left side equals the negative of the right side. This injects fake solutions that don't belong. If we did square both sides, here's what we'd get. This expands into a six-degree polynomial. Not only is this unwieldy to solve, but it's contaminated with those fake solutions I mentioned. We need a cleaner approach. Here's where things get interesting. The expression x cubed minus 3x has a very particular structure that should remind you of a trigonometric identity. The cosine triple angle formula says that cosine of 3 theta equals 4 cosine cubed theta minus 3 cosine theta. Notice how similar this looks to our expression. Our expression x cubed minus 3x is crying out to be written in terms of cosine. The question is, what substitution makes this work? If we want x cubed minus 3x to match the cosine identity, we need to account for that coefficient of 4. The right substitution is x equals 2 cosine theta. So let's make the substitution x equals 2 cosine theta. This single move will unlock the entire problem. Before we go further, we need to check something crucial. Can this substitution actually capture every possible solution? We can't just assume it works everywhere. We already know x must be at least negative 2, but is there an upper limit? Let's find out. Let me define f of x as the left side minus the right side. When I plug in x equals 2, I get 8 minus 6 minus 2, which is 0. So x equals 2 is definitely a solution. Now, what happens for x values bigger than 2? The derivative will tell us whether this function is increasing or decreasing. For any x bigger than 2, the first term 3x squared minus 3 is definitely larger than 9. The second term is positive but quite small, less than 1 fourth. This means the derivative is always positive for x greater than 2. Since our function starts at 0 when x equals 2 and then increases forever, it never comes back down to 0. There are no solutions beyond x equals 2, so all solutions are trapped between negative 2 and 2. Here's why our substitution works perfectly. When theta ranges from 0 to pi, 2 cosine theta sweeps out exactly the interval from negative 2 to 2. Every possible solution is covered. Now that we know our substitution is valid, let's see what happens to the equation. Starting with the left side. We start with x cubed minus 3x. Substituting x equals 2 cosine theta everywhere. This becomes 8 cosine cubed theta minus 6 cosine theta. I can factor out a 2 from both terms. And look what's inside the parentheses. That's exactly the cosine triple angle formula. So the entire left side becomes 2 cosine of 3 theta. Now for the right side. We have the square root of x plus 2. We apply the same substitution here, replacing and x with 2 cosine theta. We apply the same substitution here, replacing x with 2 cosine theta. This gives us the square root of 2 cosine theta plus 2. I can factor out the 2 from inside the square root. Now I have the square root of 2 times 1 plus cosine theta. 
Here's another trigonometric identity coming to the rescue. 1 plus cosine theta equals 2 cosine squared of theta over 2. Let me use that identity to replace 1 plus cosine theta. This becomes the square root of 2 times 2 cosine squared of theta over 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So this becomes the square root of 4 cosine squared of theta over 2. Now be careful here. The square root of something squared isn't just that something, it's the absolute value. This becomes 2 times the absolute value of cosine of theta over 2. But here's why we can drop the absolute value bars. Our domain for theta runs from 0 to pi, which means theta over 2 runs from 0 to pi over 2. In that range, cosine is always positive. So the absolute value signs disappear, leaving us with 2 cosine of theta over 2. Let me put both sides together. 2 cosine of 3 theta equals 2 cosine of theta over 2. Both sides have a factor of 2 that we can cancel. This simplifies to cosine of 3 theta equals cosine of theta over 2. When cosine of a equals cosine of b, we know that a equals 2k pi plus or minus b, where k is any integer. This gives us two families of solutions to consider. First, the plus case. 3 theta equals 2, k pi plus theta over 2. I'll collect the theta terms by subtracting theta over 2 from both sides. This gives us 5 theta over 2 equals 2k two pi. To solve for theta, I'll multiply both sides by 2 fifths. This gives theta equals 4k pi over 5. Now the minus case. 3 theta equals 2k pi minus theta over 2. This time I'll add theta over 2 to both sides. This gives 7 theta over 2 equals 2k pi. Multiplying both sides by 2 sevenths, this gives theta equals 4k pi over 7. These formulas give infinitely many solutions, but we only care about theta values between 0 and pi. From the first family, k equals 0 gives theta equals 0, k equals 1 gives 4 pi over 5, and k equals 2 gives 8 pi over 5, which is too big. From the second family, k equals 0 again gives theta equals 0, k equals 1 gives 4 pi over 7, and k equals 2 is again too large. So our candidates are theta equals 0, 4 pi over 5, and 4 pi over 7. But we're not done yet. There's one more constraint we need to check. The right side of our original equation is a square root, which means it's always non-negative. So the left side, x cubed minus 3x, must also be non-negative. In terms of theta, this means cosine of 3 theta must be non-negative. Let's check each of our candidates. Theta equals 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, which is definitely positive. Theta equals 4 pi over 5. We need cosine of 12 pi over 5. Since cosine repeats every 2 pi, this is the same as cosine of 2 pi over 5, which is also positive. Theta equals 4 pi over 7. Cosine of 12 pi over 7 reduces to cosine of 2 pi over 7, which is positive as well. All three candidates pass the test. These are our complete set of solutions. Now, let's convert these back to x values. Theta equals 0 gives x equals 2 cosine of 0, which is just 2. The second solution is 2 cosine of 4 pi over 5, and this is where things get beautiful. It turns out that cosine of 4 pi over 5, which comes from the geometry of regular pentagons, equals negative 1 plus the square root of 5, all over 4. Substituting this exact value, when I multiply by 2, the 4 becomes a 2, and I get negative 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. That's negative phi, the golden ratio. The third solution, 2 cosine of 4 pi over 7, doesn't have a nice closed form, but it's approximately negative 0 0.445. Let me show you how perfectly our algebra matches the geometry. Here are our original functions. Look at that perfect alignment. 
Every solution we calculated algebraically lands exactly on an intersection point. What started as a cubic equation that seemed resistant to standard methods revealed its secrets through trigonometry, ultimately connecting us to one of mathematics' most famous constants, the golden ratio. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed seeing how trigonometry can unlock seemingly unrelated algebraic problems, you might like some of the other videos on this channel, and as always, let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next.